runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land, Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following the Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Bob Charlie Sierra, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Niner clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's 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 listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's cleared to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. Well, we got a tricycle. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green uh, green dot, then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine all the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. We're Charlie's here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Can and Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, right. go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My yeah, Here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the flagman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out the, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to re-sequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the down one? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once we're out, too. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain BFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get, uh, try to get you back here. Uh, Canard's got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're going to land on runway 9. Number two, you're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final, you're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind, the, yeah, out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Yeah, well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that. After 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one, what kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type, keep it airborne for me, keep it airborne, and I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there, go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers, at the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. T-minus one minute and counting. Hello. One. Hello. Hello.
Hello. I think I do believe it's all working. We have been a few minor technical hitches earlier tonight, mainly down to my fingers not working at the proper time. So apologies for that. Thank you very, very much for joining us on this cold November night. Um, soon be fireworks, hopefully not tonight. Um, so what's going on? Well, first thing we have to, as usual, thank Sky Demon for being fantastically generous and sponsoring the live stream tonight. That's uh, very good. Thank you very much. It really couldn't happen without them. And if you're one of those rare people who've never tried Sky Demon, jump on over, download the app from uh, App Store or Google Play or whatever it's called in Android and give it a go for 30 days. I doubt there's many people who haven't, but if you haven't, give it a go. So here's this week's tip, which is coming to you from Rob Hart, who you would have met at various shows or on the phone. Hi, I'm Rob from Skydemon, and here's today's top tip. Today, I'll be showing the flight details menu in Skydemon, which is where you can set a few details about your flight, which will give your planning a bit more depth. With a route on screen, tap the route button, then flight details. Here we can set various things, such as the aircraft we intend to fly, the amount of fuel we intend to take on board, things like takeoff time, and the cruising level that Skydemon will use as standard for all legs. You can get to that menu with just one touch by tapping the time and distance readout in the top center of the screen. For more information about Skydemon, you can find our documentation on our website and within the app under the Help menu. Well, there you go. That, that, that was one I did know, um, and one that I don't use very often, um, mainly because I generally fly the same aircraft, or at least two aircraft that are so similar that it doesn't make any difference. If only if only on the Skydemon function where it says select aircraft, as you hit select aircraft, it causes you know, the aeroplane of your choice to appear in front of you, like some game. <laughs> we, should, we should link the fantasy hangar through to yeah. select aircraft, shouldn't we? Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. I'm pushing, it's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> I've still got the Cessna. Yeah, <laughs> selected Spitfire. What's going wrong? <laughs> um, so, what have we got tonight? Well, uh, we've got Simon Keeling with a recording of the weather. Um, I'm not sure if Johnny actually mentioned to him uh, about his misdemeanor last week. I, um, I did hint. I did hint, and there was no um, no comment in the reply. <laughs> I told him straight in an email, and I've not heard back either from him, so I don't know. <laughs> this could be the last weather of the... <laughs> so we'll have weather in a minute, then we're going to rattle through news, we've got a slightly different fantasy hangar, do you want to tell people what that is, Ed, so they can uh, start getting their calculators out? They can, they, they can start thinking about it, it'll be, it'll be all about efficiency, so we're looking for very efficient four-place aeroplanes. That's right. All will be revealed. Mm -hmm. All will be revealed. There you go. Um, I reckon we ought to go and play the weather and see if Simon's actually sent the right one through. What do you reckon? There's a problem. Here we go. Question first. Peter Cox says, who's that geezer with the beard? We're not really? sure. Either, Peter. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's, we didn't recognize him either. I think he just dialed in. Anyway, here's, here's the weather. Here you go. Evening all. Are oh, you missing me then? Yeah, of course you are. Uh, great to be with you this evening. Sorry, I cannot be with you live. Must do something with my hair though tonight. Um, anyway, uh, hopefully uh, you're able to get a little bit of flying in during the course of this weekend. It's a bit hit and miss as to exactly when we're going to be able to fly uh, or not. This is the satellite picture from this afternoon. I wanted to show you basically because it's a lovely picture. Uh, it shows quite well the northerly flow that we've got coming down the North Sea. This bringing some showers across eastern coast. Transitioning now from that polar air mass into a tropical maritime air mass coming in behind a warm front that's coming up from the southwest but you can see here some clear skies in between one or two showers across the Welsh mountains a few showers across Scotland and one or two showers around central and southern areas as well during the course of this afternoon so much you can pick up from these satellite pictures particularly late afternoon as we get into the winter months 
So this is the forecast then for Friday. If you're lucky enough perhaps to be able to get in the air or try to get in the air tomorrow, um, it looks as if central southern parts of England are generally OK, particularly in the morning. Base is probably above 4,000 feet, but we are between two warm fronts, one dragging its way southeastwards, one moving its way northeastwards, bringing in that more moist air that we've just seen on the satellite picture all the time. So I think it brings drizzle to western coast of Scotland, northwest England, northern and western coast of Wales, eventually western coast of Cornwall as well. And bases will be lowering too. You see here on the cloud ceiling forecast. So this is height of cloud above ground level. These yellow colours that are starting to move in to the west here, their base is of around a thousand feet and gradually through the afternoon those lowering bases will move east and south. I suspect visibility deteriorating as well. Now for Saturday quite a windy day, we can kind of brush over this quite quickly because it is going to be so windy. Fronts dragging their way eastwards, bringing periods of rain, severe gales in the north, gusts of 50 knots, perhaps even up to 60 knots, certainly need to be tethering down the aircraft if they're outside across Scotland, Northern England, much of Ireland, parts of the Midlands, into Wales as well. Far Far south of England may escape the worst of it, as will eastern England. Bases here probably going to be about 3,000 feet plus, but it's going to be pretty windy. So I don't think Saturday looks particularly great unless you may be feeling brave across eastern and southern areas. But Sunday looking better. Uh, the flow goes more into a northwesterly. Still windy across Scotland, perhaps into the far north of England as well. Here, I think generally non-VFR conditions because of the strength of that wind. But further south, the wind does tend to ease. It comes in on a northwesterly. It probably brings some showers around northwestern coasts into Northern Ireland, western coast of Scotland, northwest England as well. Bases here probably around 2,000 feet, a bit lower in the showers. And some of the showers penetrating into the Midlands during the course of Sunday afternoon. But for many eastern and southern areas, actually, it's not looking too bad. Yes, we'll get a few gusts coming through, but actually, base is three to 4,000 foot plus. So certainly of the weekend, it looks as if Sunday is going to be the best of the days. I showed you that satellite picture at the beginning. If you want to know more about uh, what weather information you pick up from satellite pictures and build your confidence in being able to make predictions yourself and know that when you read those official forecasts, you can trust them. So if you're going to go out for a day trip, you know you can trust the forecast to get back, then come to Aviation Weather School. My next part one course is on the consecutive Saturday mornings of the 27th of November and the 4th of December between 09.30 and 12.30 hours. It's been great to see you there. Um, we've got a few places left. You can book your place now at weatherschool.co.uk. And uh, like I say, if you want to just get your confidence up with weather, be able to plan up to five days in advance and spot those weather windows and just understand weather for flying, then weather school is for you. OK, I will leave you with that for now. Have a great weekend. Uh, if you are flying, fly safely and I'll catch you next week. Thanks again for watching. Have a great weekend. Bye for now. Do you think with all those tricks, he's in line for Panto this year? <laughs> <laughs> We can't not out. We we have to see that again sometime. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Is that a bit of wishful thinking with the hair? <laughs> <laughs> I it's... don't know. I, I was. I, I. I won't bore you with this, but there's in the software that I don't have and I haven't learned. There's a way of automatically tracking it, so I had to track it manually, uh -huh. which is why it's only on a little short bit. Uh -huh. but, um, Mm -hmm. So um, just before we go on, uh, Paul Fraser Benison asks, could Sky Demon do a CA chart background, please? Paul, it just so happens that I know that this it is possible in in my own Sky Demon top tip. Simply select on the charts icon mm. and select chart styles UK CA Nats. Not sure why you do that because the Sky Demon one's quite good, but yeah. anyway, if you want the CA chart, go for that. <laughs> Blimey! Uh, and two Ed, and in one day. Yeah, but you yeah. didn't do it in a Rob Hart voice. No, no, I, 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 I haven't got the skill to go. Hi, I'm Rob from Sky Demon. You sounded a bit more like Hannah there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, anyway, and, enough, and, enough madness. On with the and, news. And, and but before we do, if if you're talking about the CHR, as in, could you have a rasterized background of one? Then I'm uh, sure it's possible, but who the hell would want one of those? Because the letters wouldn't turn upside down. It'd be, it'd be, ah, 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 that'd be, that'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? It'd be like buying a car and riding the horse instead.
Is that um, the one where you have to have the dreadlocks, or is that compl something completely different? I don't know. I don't know what. Rasterize. <laughs> okay, forget oh, it. Pick yeah. it, pick it. <laughs> Cultural Ooh, reference. Paul Sengupta's got it already. He said that's the chart style, not the CA chart. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, but this why would you want a rasterized? Yeah. Why would you want a digital version of a paper chart where everything doesn't turn up and down and scale properly and all the rest of it? Yes. You wouldn't, would you? No. I don't think. Anyway, Andrew I, I Kennedy wouldn't. isn't convinced that that's Rob's real voice. Trust us, <laughs> Andrew. It is Rob's real voice. It yes. is. Yes. It is. News. Which, which news. one? Right. Yes. Yeah, sorry, news. I was just trying to... Right, sorry, let me catch up here. Let's have some news. It must be time for the news. Dave, would you like to tell us about the new issue? Yes, the new issue, the uh, December 2021 issue, last issue of this year, theoretically. Uh, the cover story, what we used to call the splash in newspaper terms, Ian flies the Pipistrel Veles Electro. What's more, he reads the pilot's operating handbook and discovers all sorts of interesting facts. It's, a, it's actually a very good read, and uh, it's a bit more than the average flight test because it's got an electric engine. And there's a lot to a lot to consider there. Um, but anyway, great read, nice pictures, good story. Um, so that's, that's the cover story. Also in the issue, avionics as a feature by Ed. Yeah, Ed. And how to upgrade your panel over the winter. So um, Ed's taking a look at the various avionics around at the moment. There's lots, and now's the right time to do it if you're going to, you know, put your aircraft into downtime. On the safety side. Um, Steve Ayers, our safety editor, explores the subject of airspeed. We all need it, but when it's not being displayed accurately, all sorts of things can go wrong. Anyways, Steve talks about it, and what's more, he's still alive. Very good. So, um, we, should, we should get Steve on one day, actually. We should. Yeah. We should, yes. Good guy. Uh, it's very easy to read, Steve's stuff. It's, uh, it's very knowledgeable, uh, but an easy read. Um, on In first solo... We talked to Catherine Maloney, who talks about going from fixed wing to rotary. <laughs> How difficult can it be? Very Easy. is the answer. Very. <laughs> Completely different. Uh, In the flying adventure. Who... Sorry, carry on here. Uh, I was going to say, if anyone doesn't know who Catherine Maloney is, Catherine Maloney is the daughter of Tom Maloney, and Tom Maloney is Mr. Transair. Yes. Mm. Yes. Also, one of the new, one of the latest um, uh, CST uh, aviation ambassadors. I've forgotten that already. Yep. Um, next item is is the flying adventure, the call of the glaciers. No, this has nothing to do with the CEA. Um, a chap called Garrett Fisher, who some might conclude has a near death fixation, he flew eighty three hours in a Piper Cub to photograph all of the non-polar glaciers. The photographs are extraordinary. And when you read his story, that accompanies the pictures, you wonder, how are you still alive? Uh, it's just incredible. Great flying, good story, fantastic photographs. And of course, this issue, you save 54 pounds with our free landing fees from Blackbush, Brayton, Crosman Moor, Fishburn, Leicester, and Wolverhampton. Great selection there. Yep. If you're a Fly Club member. Yeah, if, if you're, you're a flyer, flyer club member. Member. yes, and if you're not a flyer club member, why not? Why Come not? on, seriously, seven pound fifty a quarter at the moment. <laughs> it's going to be going up next year, but it's got to be it's got to be one of the biggest bargains to the aviation. Not only do you get uh, you get everything, just join, please. Thank you. We can't do this for nothing. Honest. Um, right. There's a link link to the new issue in the comments. Yes, excellent. Ed, tell us about a yes. new airplane. So it, uh, it appeared in Fancy Hangar a few weeks ago, the, um, the fabulous Grumman Albatross, that uh, beautiful uh, amphibian, is going back into production. And uh, we get we often come across unusual things going back into production, but I didn't see this coming. Uh, but the current owners of the type certificate, uh, an Australian company called Amphibian Aircraft Industries, um, are putting the Albatross back into production, and but this time they're replacing the Wright Cyclone radial engines with Pratt & Whitney PT6A turbines. Good choice there. Um, at the moment, uh, AAI are supplying spare parts and service to existing Albatross operators. Um, production of the Albatross was from 1949 to 66, and they built 400 and 461 were made. Uh, but apparently AAI, AAI say amphibian aircraft fill a special niche uh, in an increasingly populous world. Um, so of course, 
decided to start building some and they're offering a variety of uh, variety of different configurations depending on what you want uh, a very a kind of different setup with passengers and cargo or an aero medivac or a search and rescue capable uh, aircraft um, interestingly as well the chairman of aai adds the high net worth market for the Grumman Albert for the Albatross is extremely promising. To the north of north of Australia, Fiji hosts numerous high net worth individuals that own islands for both for both private and resort development use. So it's like mm, I see where the market is for this. Mm. You know, mm. some Every of these time islands, I... it says some of these islands have changed hands so many times I've lost count because owners need to find reliable, efficient, timely, and cost effective <laughs> methods of transporting cargo. <laughs> <laughs> is that your sick bag? I don't know. Is it his sick bag or is it his Tommy Cooper hat? Yeah, I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't demonstrate its use as a fez because it's full of rubbish. Yes. But every time I hear the phrase, every time I hear someone creating a market for high net worth individuals, yeah. I feel the need to, to reach for a yeah. sick bag or a bin to be sick in. Yeah, I put the put the albatross back into production. Brilliant idea, but don't yep. target it specifically at, um, at high net worth individuals. It's like so. if it, on the on the occasions before COVID, when I used to occasionally fly through uh, Geneva, yeah, you just get that walking travelator that's going past all of those really really smarmy private banking ads or ads for like watches that are a hundred <laughs> grand or whatever. And I, I can't, I can't do that whole travelator without being sick at least three times. It's just like everyone thinks I've got an eating disorder or something. It's not. It's just so smarmy, sick. But anyway, good, good. I don't have anything against people who got a ton of money. But seriously, yeah. no, but, but yes, if we see some more more um, seaplanes coming along, fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Right, talking of airplanes coming along, Johnny, tell us about yeah. this hybrid one. Pipistrelle. So their four-seat Tora called the Panthera has completed uh, the first set of flight tests with a hybrid electric uh, engine. Um, the flights were made middle of last month from an airport that I can't pronounce in Slovenia. Um, and they actually included fully electric takeoffs. So they, they weren't using both sets of powertrains. They were just, just using the electric motor for takeoff. Um, so the first unit uses just a normal fuel-driven generator to charge the batteries. Um, and then power the electric motor, while the second one relies on that power in the fuel cells um, to produce power, which will give you zero emission flight. Um, and they're currently doing the flight test and they're building up a data bank and see how it all works. Um, but they're hoping that the target for um, certification is 2022, um, and it's going to be available, first of all, with the Lycoming IO540, 260 horsepower, and it looks good, so I'm, I'm sure that will be a really punchy airplane to fly it's it's been a long time coming hasn't it the pantera and it's still still in an unusual kind of bit of the it's like it's for sale in the states at the moment but only as an experimental mm. so, I, I, you know they, they, they do great work pipistrelle um and i think the pantera is fantastic but um yeah hopefully all of that will come good mm. yeah i i like pipistrelle aircraft but the pantera has had a little bit of an interesting time of it and when it first appeared at friedrichshafen a gazillion years ago it was like look at this pantera it's gonna have i don't know five horsepower engine and five 500 knots and <laughs> david yeah. Eve says that's the fantasy hangar this week at the moment david it's not an airplane you could go out and buy so yeah, sadly no. mm. yeah it yeah. would be fantasy there you go yeah, Chris. Chris asked the question: Can I email the team if it's if it's for a good if it's to be nice to us, Chris? Yes, we'll we'll tell you how. If it's going to be mean to us, we'll not tell you how. No. <laughs> Ian's fez at Seager.aero If it's going to, yeah. <laughs> my bin's got its own email. Yes, no, we will tell you how to do that. No problem at all. Right, um, I'm up next. I think I'm going to have a little chat about the. Um, the no tam stuff you would it, you'd have to be mad to not have noticed that cop 26 uh, was going on up in glasgow and you'd be mad to not notice that the whole swathe of scotland was basically closed to general aviation so the people at ais uh, sent out a no tam and couldn't uh, i don't know exactly what happened but originally it seems that they thought they couldn't actually have an agl figure in in the no tam same where it was so somehow they kind of calculated it and went with 2000 feet 
And I don't really know how that that's no good because then some of the nav software came out with tempo restricted area activated 2000 feet msl to 10000 feet msl now if you saw that you think hey that's not too bad 2000 feet i can go through that no problem at all um apart from the high ground stuff obviously um but that was that that was just plain wrong because we all know if you read the aic it was actually 400 feet so eventually uh, and this is um it, in large part, thanks to Paul Cadell, who was sort of getting and trying to get the thing sorted and feeling that it was really kind of needed sorting urgently, um, they issued another NOTAM because they then discovered that you could actually put uh, 400 feet AGL, which is what it was, in line F of the NOTAM. I didn't know that line F were specified the lower limit at the time, but I do now. I'll probably forget it by next week, but I know it at the moment. Um, <laughs> however, when they did that, we, everyone thought, great, it'll be machine readable, but they screwed it up and decided to do two overlapping notepad for whatever strange reason. Mm. Uh, and then the, and then they did a third one. And I think on the third one or the fourth iteration, they actually got it right. Now, whether they... It's tempting to think they got it wrong because they were just bloody-minded and thought, well, we'll show these people. Or maybe it was just they didn't know, or maybe it was something worse. I don't know. Um, but... It just seems to me the CA have said to loads of people, and quite rightly, look, use a moving map. Don't fly in temporary danger areas. Navigate prop. Then if you're yeah. going to do that and you're going to put a note out, the main purpose of which is to stop general aviation, a whole bunch of people flying around, then at least get it right and, and have, a, have a think about how it's going to be presented. It's not, well, it is difficult, but you just do it right. They, they got there in the end. Wouldn't it be better if they got there first? I mean, maybe maybe next time anyone infringes some controlled airspace by accident, you go, yeah, okay, give us give us four goes at that route. I'll get it right in the end. I'm taking my lessons <laughs> from AIS. <laughs> anyway, that'd be the better yeah. way. I'm yeah, and absolutely, yeah, brilliant work by Tim at Sky Demon to manually keep it accurate amongst the carnage because effectively, that that's yeah, every time they screwed up, Tim had to go in and do all that funky Cody mm -hmm. stuff that people do um, and, and make it right, which is. Uh, not really how it should be. Uh, and a few people on our preview. Uh, never Man, <laughs> Club says, never mind. They have a just culture when it comes to mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and and uh, and just to be just serious, get right, it right. Be, we, we, should be. sorry, <laughs> it should be just get it right. <laughs> just get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, given the people who produce that stuff are pro professionals at producing that stuff, then then really it should be right, shouldn't it? And and that's a pretty safety critical thing. <clears throat> so anyway, there you go. Um, let's move on from that to the next news story, which I do Dave. believe is Dave and his electric aircraft. Right. Well, a, um, there's a Swiss team uh, competing in the Air Race E series next year. Air Race E, e is for electric. And uh, it's a quite a strange name called Pi Aeronets. So far as I can work out, it's got nothing to do with pies. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they call themselves Pi Aeronefs, and they they're not only just making this electric aircraft you can see on the screen in front of you, but it's also they're also setting themselves up as an aircraft manufacturer. So no pressure then. Um, they plan to compete in next year's series, and unlike some of the other teams, they've taken the very hard route of designing, developing, building, and proving a brand new aircraft from the wheels up. This is everything you see in this picture is brand new. Um, a key point of the design is locating the batteries in the wing. You know, that makes sense. You know, that's where the fuel will go in a I have gas burning aircraft. But um, it's quite hard to do. You know, the batteries aren't, they, they don't fit into a nice expandable bladder the way the fuel does. Um, they have to be precise. And also the wing does bend a bit during flying. So the batteries have to be able to cope with that. And apparently they already had to chuck away the first wing they designed and built and uh, restart the whole process, which is pretty, wow. a pretty difficult place to be, mm. you can imagine. I, I want to know why it's got such a long undercarriage. Yeah. yeah. I, I can only imagine that that's because, um, well, Andrew Kennedy says that's what I call prop clearance. <laughs> Hopefully because it's an electric motor, it's because you can drive a nice big prop. But mm. that does look yes. like an awful lot of prop clearance. It does. It does, yeah. yes. It's also got a V-tail, as you may notice from that picture, which is to reduce the drag. So okay. they're, they're kind of thinking of everything. You have to say, though, looking at it, sitting there in that little hangar, it does look the Sun Hun's appendages. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just had to drop that one in. 
a sand hund, in case you didn't know, it's a Swiss mountain dog. Ah, I see. <sighs> I thought it was some kind of dog. Tony Bishop says that they're presenting it at the RA RAES Light Aircraft Design Conference on 15th of November. Good reminder, oh. Tony. Oh, crikey. Do you mean I've yeah. upset the Swiss as well and they're coming here? <laughs> yes, they are coming here. So un <laughs> unlike the Ukrainians, <laughs> who haven't been to see you yet, Dave, the Swiss <laughs> will be here. I don't know, I don't know, if, I don't know if they're from the French-speaking part of Switzerland, um, but Pi, as you... As you pronounce it, P is um, magpie. Yes, Bill French. Allen has ah. pointed that out. That one out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Dan Smith says a trousered undercarriage, though Ed, not trousered. Dan, it's it's kind of the it's fared. It's not really a trouser. Mm. I, I, I'll, I'll raise that on a technicality there. There's, <laughs> there's a spat at the bottom, and there's like a fairing on the leg. Not a true trouser. A Swiss fashion trouser. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Anyway, moving anyway. on, the, another electric racer, another contender for the uh, Air Race E-Series, maybe, is Nottingham University, uh, who revealed their uh, ver their uh, entry into the uh, series. I, um, I just want to do a quick comparison so you just get the full effect. Swiss <laughs> one. Swiss one. Oh, Nottingham oh. one. Nottingham <laughs> one. Yes. Go back to Swiss. Oh, Wow. Yes, and you wow. notice how they ne neatly put that that tanker in the background. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. oh yeah. <laughs> As, initially, yeah. I looked at this and went, but nothing's changed. And then I noticed there's like a there's like two inches of prop shaft extension, so you, it yeah. kind of hints at the fact there's something diff slightly different going on. Mm. But as you can tell from this, as you can tell from this picture, they've taken a more conventional route of developing electric propulsion for. A cassette. Is that how you say it? Cassut? Cassut? It is, yeah. Cassut. Single seat racer. And um, although conventional doesn't really cut it, the project lead uh, chap called Professor Michael Gallia, he said the challenge of fitting everything in together inside the existing engine bay and achieving a similar weight distribution was pretty hard. They had to use um, a computer design system to, to, to do that. The news is, though, that uh, they successfully completed ground tests. It does work, and it, it reaches the speeds and all that kind of thing. But when I asked them, uh, because in the press release they sent out, it didn't say this, it wasn't clear, but I went back to Professor Michael and I asked him if the aircraft was going to race in Air Race E and who was going to be the pilot. The answer came back as possibly. Um, so I'm not sure they're really going to race that. It might just be a university project. Mm. Hmm. He probably he probably misread it and, and thought it was you asking if you could be the pilot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Or is there? Or is there we'll another reply, Dave, Dave, saying, "Okay, then." Yeah. <laughs> is, there no, captain, is there a captain possibly out there somewhere? Yes, <laughs> maybe. <point. laughs> cool. All right. Uh, next is uh, Pilot Careers Live. Pilot Careers Live is a show that we're running on Saturday. We've been doing it for years and years and years, but we haven't been doing it over the last two years, obviously, because of COVID. So if you are interested in a career on the flight deck or you know someone who is, get yourselves down to Heathrow on Saturday. We're at um, Softel Hotel. You do have to have a ticket. You can't buy a ticket on the door. You can only get it in advance. And if you can't make it, but you're still interested anyway, go to www.pilotcareerslive.com and follow the links and register and you can get it online. Uh, we'll be streaming all day, uh, including various interviews and all sorts of other great stuff. So you can do that free of charge or you can attend in person, but you have to buy a ticket and you have to do it in advance. And we're asking you to take a lateral flow test and all that other stuff. Um, but if you're interested in a career on the flight deck, come and see us on Saturday. So Very looking good. forward to that. Uh, just going back to one of the news items we missed, the um, oh. the, the Air One <laughs> EV toll. Oh, so we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, getting ahead of yourself a little bit there. Um, so um, this has been announced just, uh, recently. It's the all-electric uh, two-seater EV, EV toll, uh, and it's designed. It's it's a, a lots of EV tolls are all about just sitting there and being flown. This is a, an EV toll for PPLs. So um, obviously the CIA will have something to say about licensing. I'm sure to do with this. Um, but basically the Air One, it's designed to. Um, it offers a range of 110 miles on a single charge. At speeds of up to 155, um, it, they claim, uh, and a flight time of one hour. And mm. Interestingly, when you look at the spe specs, it says max speed 155, cruise speed 
100 miles an hour. Range, 110 miles. Max flight time, one hour. It's like, I'm, I'm it's, it's <laughs> slightly confusing numbers in there somewhere. Max, for, uh, max power of this thing is 771 horsepower. So that's probably why the battery can't last very long. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll take a 200 kilogram payload. Um, and uh, Air described the, the, this vehicle, the one, as a sporty, easy to operate EV toll, uh, vertical takeoff and landing machine um, designed for individual consumer own, um, ownership. They're taking orders, but they haven't said how much. Uh, apparently, the price will come in 2022. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. There must be dozens and dozens of these various EV toll projects going on all over the place. Yeah, dozens of them. I mean, it's exciting though. I know, it, it, is, it, it, it is. It's exciting. like it's a bit more of a looker than the um the the one from the the Japanese guys who were offering yes. the the EV yeah. toll kit plane. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, that is true. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, maybe in maybe in maybe we'll all be reporting from those. Who knows? You, anyway, <laughs> cool. I was going cool. to say, if you imagine this, all the investment that's going into EV tolls, if that had got into light aircraft. Where will we be now? If you, you know. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Peter Satchwell says Ed gets grade A for maths. That's why they gave me that story and didn't give it to Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about maths. It's going to come yeah. up later, isn't it? Mm. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. So much maths. Yes. Right then, Johnny. Where's Zara? Oh, yeah. Zara. Oh, Zara. Zara. So she's in Russia. Um, she's currently in a place called Sokol or Sokol. Um, and she's got three more Russian stops uh, finishing in Vladivostok. And then she'll be flying from there to a place called Gimpo in South Korea. So that will take a, you know, she's slowly getting further south and into war warmer weather. And then by the middle of the month, she should be in, I'm just looking at the map here, Malaysia and Indonesia in about a week's time. Um, so yeah, she should have good Wi-Fi and hot weather. So we'll probably tap her up for another interview. I think. Yeah, yeah, that will be good. That will be good. Well, I do believe that's the end of the news. Uh, is it? Seen... Katkin very quickly says, "Has anyone seen Joby's e-plane fly yet?" There's been loads of videos of that. Mm. So uh, check uh, those out. I'll see if I can you, find you. Or, or Katkin, do you mean in person? Ah, yeah. maybe. But, yeah, but, but there's yeah, been lots, lots of video of that. So. Yep. Good. Well, uh, in terms of rat watch and stuff like that, it's really just COP26 at the moment, isn't it? That's still there yeah. that you need to be careful of. So uh, we're going to move swiftly on from that and straight on to our interview. Let's see if we can do this in a vaguely slick manner, shall we? Uh -huh. only, only vaguely, though. Oh, oh that's uh, not even vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There we go. Now it is. Hello, Graham. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Graham Mountford, thanks for joining us. Um, now, we, we're going to be talking about the um, civil air support charity. Um, I thought, could, could you just begin by explaining who you are and what you do within it? And then we'll talk about it afterwards. Sure. I'm Graham Outford. So I've been a member of the charity for some years. Uh, I have two roles. One is as an operations manager. So that's a point of contact for agencies looking for uh, support. And uh, the other is as a volunteer pilot uh, flying in aid of the community, which is our, our role as a charity. Brill. Um, so can you just tell us a bit about what CAS do? Do you, do you, do you abbreviate it to CAS or is there another yeah, yeah, CAS, short terminology? So Civil air support, but CAS um, for, for ease of use. Um, so what we do is we, we are all volunteer pilots uh, and observers and supporters. Uh, and the aim is to make our aircraft and ourselves available for the good of the community. So what we try to do is fill gaps that fall between professional services and a need um, with no cost to anybody other than the pilots themselves. So lots of things will work with other charities uh, to extend their capabilities. So, for example, we work with uh, National Blood Bikes to travel, uh, to transport time critical medications, blood uh, treatments over longer distances than the motorbikes can do efficiently. 
uh, work with animal rescue charities uh, to get animals from remote areas to hospitals with a reduced journey time uh, and a whole range of other things. During COVID, we've carried uh, PPE to, for example, the Isle of Man when all of the um, scheduled services were cancelled. And we also assist with missing person searches beyond the urgent search by the red light, the blue light services, but where the families are still needing uh, help and still needing to believe somebody cares. Fantastic. Um, so what, I mean, the first thing, th there's lots of different things <laughs> that you're doing there, that different tasks that sound like they'd need different aircraft. So what kind of aircraft have you got at your disposal? Well, we've got on the books, um, Everything from uh, open cockpit uh, gyrocopters um, through uh, micro lights, uh, typical Cessna 172s, um, RVs, up through bigger uh, six seat singles and light twins. And the biggest aircraft I think we've got uh, in our fleet at the moment is a Cessna 414, so a pressurized uh, twin. And, and what we try and do is match aircraft pilot and their experience to the need uh, to try to make it fit for purpose um, so while you might think you know big big powerful aircraft are great for some things a slow um, simple light aircraft is better mm, real and, and one question that's just popped up from jonathan smith is this the same as skywatch uh it was yes it, yes indeed so Sky, skywatch civil air patrol was the original name of the charity um, but it didn't really adequately reflect the range of things we do. We were not patrolling. We were not watching. Uh, so civil air support, it's supporting the civil authorities and charities uh, rather than the sort of more militaristic patrolling. We're not, uh, we're not doing that. Yeah. But, yes, the same organisation, it's the same charity. It's just evolved its name. Yeah. Um, uh, we've covered a, a couple of your stories in the past month or two. Um, can can you just talk us through a couple of you know well both of those I mean there was, there was a great story about the seal being transported um, and and you know are there any secrets to carrying a seal or do you just wrap it up and stick it in the in, in yeah, the in well, baggage compartment <laughs> so so yeah um, seal seals are interesting I've, I've I've been carrying seals in planes for about eight years now uh, on and off and a number of our members are getting involved with that now so the, the trick with carrying a a seal is the welfare of, of the animal and the safety of the flight and making sure that the two don't get mixed up. So we always insist that there's at least two people on board. So the pilot flying the aircraft and somebody who's competent to look after the welfare of the animal. Um, now, as it happens, I got involved originally uh, and, I, and I'm both. I, I'm a marine mammal medic with British Divers Marine Life Rescue and a pilot. Um, and it happens my daughter is also a trained marine mammal medic and zookeeper. So even in COVID, we could go as a double crew. Where she would look after the animal. I would fly the plane. Um, but then we also, we, we will take people from uh, the one we did um, last week. We flew a seal from uh, Inverness to Shetland um, with the SSPCA, Scottish uh, SPCA. So there we actually had three people from the SPCA on board. Um, and me flying the plane. Uh, we picked up that seal. It was one that had been rescued by another charity, British Divers, um, in Aberdeen. It was an Arctic ring seal. Uh, only 30 have ever been sighted in UK waters in the last 100 years, so it's a very rare occurrence. It's not supposed to be here. It had somehow got lost. It was underweight, dehydrated, and had injuries. That was taken to the SSPCA uh, um, Wildlife Rescue Centre uh, near Stirling. They uh, looked after it, they cured it, they brought it back to health, prepared it for rewilding, and then they needed to get it as far north as possible because if it had been released for, for where it was found, chances are it wouldn't, it would have restranded again. So the idea was they wanted to get it to Shetland as far north as they could to release it to give it the best chance. Mm. But that journey by road and ferry would have taken around 18 hours. Uh, and that would not have been good for the welfare of the animal. Knowing that we'd helped with seals before, they gave us a call. As it happened, um, I was going to be up uh, in Vaness anyway that weekend. Uh, my dad lives up there. Uh, and so I said, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So we met them in Inverness, uh, loaded the seal up. 
in a nice secure uh, crate. We use the same sort of crate you'd use for transporting a dog in um, an airliner um, to make sure it's secure with say three SPCA uh, trained people on board. And we flew up to Sumbra from Inverness. Um, it was about an hour because we had a 60 knot headwind. Um, <laughs> and the sea was extremely rough. So we're pretty glad we went on a ferry. Uh, and then we went up to a wildlife sanctuary in the north of Shetland for the night and released him in a north facing cove at the north end of the island the next morning. Is, uh, is, is, just to interrupt you a second, is we got that, that pit? Is that the seal or is that a different? One. No, that is the one. Yep, that's his That's the one. Yeah. What was that called? An Arctic? Arctic ring seal. Okay. Uh, there you go. So, and it was great to just see him. And he just got into the water, had a look around for a minute, and then he was off like a, a rocket heading north. Uh, it was great to see. Brilliant. So, how can people actually get involved with civil air support? Are you actively looking for new members and? Well, we're, we're always interested to hear from people who want to help. I mean, the key thing is uh, this this is um, the pilots who do this do it effectively at their own expense. Uh, so we, we can't pay for somebody to do a flight. Uh, that would start getting toward commercial operations and all sorts of things, and we're not geared up for that. Um, but anyone who's got an aircraft and is willing to give up their time uh, and uh, take part in these we're very keen to hear from but also observers uh, people who are involved in um, aviation but not necessarily have their own aircraft or pilot license can get involved as supporters they can get involved on ground operations um, for example we when we ever have a mission going we will have an ops manager on the ground who will be coordinating things at each end he'll be following the flight he'll be advising the people meeting the aircraft at the other end of progress liaising with airfields uh, helping to raise um, you know, support at the airfields as well as well as people who can take photographs for some of the missions we get involved with uh, who have got a good pair of eyes key thing is um, Pilot needs to fly the plane, so we do need other people on board who can do other roles to not distract from the safety of the flight. Uh, or we can just get involved in supporting with um, with donations as well. We're a charity, um, and it's it's twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, actually, a lot of our stuff we do during the weekends. Um, yeah. We tend to do apart from things like the seal rescue, where we can pick the day that we do it within a window. So we can fit it in with crew availability, also with weather. And what they'll do is say, we've got a seal. We need to get it to a hospital within the next week. Is there a, a window for doing that? Other things like um, urgent medications may well be weekdays. Uh, there's a particular type of treatment that's only produced in Birmingham and has a five-hour shelf life. And it used to be taken by blood bikes to hospitals where people needed treatment but they had a limited radius they could do that around Birmingham and then during Covid so so before Covid people would be brought to Birmingham hospital for the treatment during Covid that became very difficult to do so we got involved with the blood bikes to relay that treatment and we've actually did uh, we took one from Birmingham to uh, Shetland one to Belfast uh, to Truro all different members all different pilots with aircraft and it's a very small package. You don't need a massive aircraft to do it. Um, but it means that that very short shelf life treatment was able to be done all over the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would happen during the week more than at weekends, whereas a lot of the more humanitarian things that we do will tend to fit around the pilot. And we tend to take a view of most of the people who get involved think, well, I'm going to look for an excuse to go flying sometime this month. I might as well do something useful when I'm flying if I can mm. um, and treat that as part of their normal kind of flying budget, if you like. Mm. Do, do you kind of, or the operations side of it, do you, do you ring up and, and just like guarantee clearances through controlled airspace or anything like that? Or is it all down to the pilot just to talk on the radio? It's a bit of a mix. So, so the ops guys will try to facilitate uh, a route if we have a particular need and we'll we'll pre-align a number of the um airport atc units and we we get immense support from atc generally on any of these things that we do as soon as i get on the radio and, and tell 
somebody in ATC that were carrying a, a rescued seal. You get a straight line wherever you want to go. We don't ask for it, but they just give it to us. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I did Newquay to Newcastle, literally in a straight line at 8,000 feet through every bit of airspace, and they just gave us that direct routing. Um, so, you know, so we do get a lot of support from our ground staff and our ground support t supporters at airports especially. So we'll try and get a member who's based at a destination airport. They'll facilitate things. But we've got um, uh, ATC staff who are members, uh, and they will help spread the word and uh, tell us what to put on a flight plan if we want to try to get priority if we're carrying sort of transplant material or something. There's a phrase you can put on that just alerts people. But the, the, the trick is you have to plan for not getting that help in your timing. But if you do get it, it just shortens everything and makes it run better. Yeah. Real. So if people are interested, what's the best way of getting in touch with you? Uh, Civil Air Support website, uh, CAS. Um, that's the best way, because if you go on to that, there will be a uh, inquiries and how do I get involved section. Uh, and then get in touch. Somebody will get back to you with uh, a little bit of a chat about what you do, what you want to offer, uh, and membership forms and so on, uh, and talk you through the kind of roles that, that you might be able to, to help with. So... You know, pilots are great, um, but there's a lot more than pilots involved in being able to carry out something successfully, including liaison with other agencies. So people who can liaise with um, uh, ground-based mountain rescue teams, search, lowland search and rescue, uh, Coast Guard, um, local resilience forums of, of councils, um, all of that, particularly with things like flooding goes on. We, we provide quite a lot of support to local councils in mapping out where the where the roads are open and flooding mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, got involved with the flooding in cumbria a few years ago around christmas time and in one hour we flew the length of every river in cumbria um, mm -hmm. with a camera taking a photo every second uh, and that gave a massive amount of intelligence to the local authority and the army who were sending heavy moving equipment to clear roads as to which mm -hmm. roads were open and where they could go so mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things that, that, that we get involved with uh, and liaison on the ground with people is just as important as actually flying the flying the aircraft. Yeah, that's fascinating. No, it sounds like you do a really good range of things, guys. Any other questions for Graham? Uh, there has been a, there's been a couple of questions in there, just just asking uh, if people donate, what what's the money used for? That's okay, so the, there's a, there's a few things that the money's used for. So were we um, Things like uh, handling fees and airport fees, where we can't, where we have to go somewhere a bit more expensive, and it's a bit unfair on the pilot to be to be taking that. We'll try and contribute, uh, but mostly it's equipment. Things like uh, cameras, radios, uh, safety equipment. That's the kind of thing that that we are most in need of. Um, that has more capabilities than a quick sort of snap snap camera, um, but also for um, uh, a bit of uh, kind of liaison, uh, being able to go to places to make contact with key players who, who may need our support. Mm -hmm. So we don't spend a lot of money. Uh, we have insurance. We have a few administrative expenses. We have a telephone line that is manned 24 hours a day by volunteers, but there's a cost involved in running that. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, bits of safety equipment primarily that we can share around the crews. Very good. Mm. Fascinating. And, and so that's uh, this is the correct this is the correct website, isn't it? Civilairsupport.com. Yep, that, that's it. Perfect. Great. So that's in the comments if anyone wants it. Brilliant. Mm. And, and to anyone thinking it, I know Graham's mentioned it about getting a clearance. If you say you have a seal on board, if you've got a, got an issue with brise and you're just generally flying around, don't go. I've have a seal on board. It's seal critical. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't use it. Please yeah. don't use it. We, we we get good support from from various agencies, but only when it's absolutely uh, helps. Uh, and the key thing with with that is um, we, we, the welfare of animal or person um, is the critical one. So we plan everything to fit around that. And if we need some additional assistance for that, then we'll ask for it. But we don't abuse that. So most of our flights are carried out under just normal everyday. VFR flying as you would when you're when you're doing your own trips. 
One, one last question, possibly, Graham. Uh, what level of pilot experience do you expect? So it, we we talk to each pilot and find out what they do, what their capabilities are, uh, and we have a crew list which lists all of everybody's experience and capabilities and our ops managers try to match the request to the right level of person so we certainly don't uh take straight out of training uh ppls because you've got to under, you've got to be able to fly the aircraft safely and competently without getting distracted by the mission and everything else but what we will do is we'll buddy up a less experienced pilot with a more experienced one on a mission so yeah typically 200 hours pilot in command but it's not an absolute it will depend a little bit on currency on how that training has been done and over what period of time it's about really assessing risk we've got some very very experienced members who are training captains with airlines who are ex um, uh, military and police um, air services who will assess uh, and make sure we're not exposing somebody to risks in their flying that, that they shouldn't be do it, taking on. But we won't we won't try and restrict. We will find roles for people, uh, even if they're not P1, they may well come along to share the workload and to understand. We do do training exercises, particularly you won't send someone on a search who hasn't been trained specifically for flying searches uh, with observers who are trained for that. A lot of them will be, you know, we have ex-maritime patrol and, and police air service people, and they act as trainers and mentors as well. So don't think that if you've just got your license, you can jump in and fly a mission, but you will be mentored and, and coached by someone who does that. Um, and they say, yeah, general rule of thumb, 200 hours plus, because you do need to be pretty able to focus on more than just the immediate. Yeah. Very good. Fantastic. Very good. I'll, right. I'll give, the, give the last comment to Paul Fraser Benison, who's has given you a new call sign, Seal <laughs> Force One. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, thanks fantastic. for coming on, Graham. Welcome. And good work. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Must be time for. Uh -huh. Well, that's fantastic activity, that isn't it? Really, really good to see. Mm. Yeah. Very, very good. Over good. To you, Ed, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, so time for Fancy Hangar. Uh, so with COP26, the centre of attention for reducing carbon emissions, it got us thinking if we could get a slot to enter the restricted airspace and land at Glasgow, what would be the most efficient GA aircraft we could pick to fly four of us from Gloucester to Glasgow? So that's a trip of 252 nautical miles. Uh, and could we do it for the lowest amount of CO2 used? Who's first? Dave. Dave. Dave, right. what a pick. Well, well, I thought what I need a slippery airframe. Yeah, you know, an aircraft that shh, through the air, minimum of effort, fast, burning the least fuel possible. So I've gone for the cozy, particularly the Mark IV, which uh, is a, a, you know, so obviously it's a canard. It's very fast, very slippery, and uh, it's you know, it's uh, it's very economical. Ah, look at that. Would you just like to do that? It's a bit like flying a Star Wars X fighter. Sorry, getting it carried away here. Anyway, but anyway, I worked. I must admit, when I put the figures forwards, no one believed me, and sure enough, I was wrong. I risk the zip lock being my strong point. But anyway, it came out as um, this thing is capable of. Uh, it burns twenty eight liters per hour, but it's fast. Now, on forty percent power, it uh, apparently does one hundred and sixty one knots. Which yeah, it's pretty good, forty percent power. So um, anyway, it uh, it would use um, forty four liters of fuel basically, which works out at one hundred and five kilograms um, of carbon dioxide, the carbon footprint. So that's that's my entry. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I'm not entirely convinced that those numbers are completely on the nail. Well, <laughs> yes, you see. <laughs> Luckily, I, and flagging up your choice as excellent, Dave, is Bill Allen. And Bill just happens to own 
the cozy in those photos because we fly, we've it's an airplane from the flyer from a flyer flight test quite a while ago. Uh, and I just happened because I, I looked at your numbers with a slightly quizzical head. I thought <laughs> I'll contact Bill and find out what the real numbers are. And actually, these are the factory you, figures. These are the factory figures. <laughs> well, yeah, Dave. After all these years, you've been a flying editor, and the, and you're you're now an editor again. And you're what do we not trust sometimes? It's a factory manufacturer figures, figures, yeah, figures isn't it? <laughs> um, but Bill, uh, Bill did say actually your speed is is pretty much spot on. But he said uh, at that cruise speed, he said more like thirty four liters an hour, which is still amazingly frugal. Uh, mm. So I quickly ran those numbers through, and that gives you one hundred and twenty seven uh, kilograms of carbon. So not far off, and still really quite good. That's a good opening, good opening gambit there, I think. So Dave with 27 kilograms. There you go. 127 kilograms. 127, sorry, 127 kilograms. Oh, no. Incidentally, I was doing a little bit of research in case anyone's interested. We just took a we took a 2.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide per litre of Avgas and 2.58 for, for jet or diesel. Um, and I know there are different figures around, but you know, we just decided to standardise on that. But if you burn a tonne of uh, carbon dioxide, apparently in order to restore that ton and there's a whole load of controversy around offsetting but it's basically mm. six trees that you need for okay. that I'll consider it. so momentary mm. suggestion from the comments Julian Treadwell this is obviously directed at you Ian a rand powered <laughs> hot air balloon <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long that would take to get to Glasgow but quite a while yeah. I imagine depends on the wind right yeah. who's next Johnny you. oh is it? No, I thought it was Ed <laughs> Oh. We can swap it and go ahead if you like. I'll go, I'll go me next. Yeah, I'll go yeah. Me next. I, We should save Johnny's because that's a work of genius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I picked the Sling aircraft TSI. So this is a kit aircraft from South Africa. Um, it's just working its way through approval for operation under the Light Aircraft Association. Uh, and the Sling TSI uses the Rotax 915AS. Now, this is Rotax's latest 141 uh, horsepower turbocharged engine got plenty of space and payload for for four people and if you put four people in it you've still got enough space uh to put fuel in it to make the trip so uh my numbers for the sling tsi ian if you can pop them up uh so this machine so sling say uh cruise on this at uh, 145 knots true airspeed uh fuel burn 28 liters an hour uh, the trip is 1.7 hours, which gives me a fuel burn of 48.6 litres. Uh, and by the multiplier, that so gives me 116 kilograms, 100, or nearly 117 kilograms of CO2. So there you go. Is that when you say is right. that still not is that still going through the LAA approval process? It's still yeah. It's um, the the um, the agent had the um, the first UK one on show at the LAA rally. Um, and it's it's been flight tested. I, I, I just, it's just kind of working its way still through the program at the moment. So no, I don't think the approvals quite come yet. To but expose my to expose my ignorance. Yeah. Um, what was the airplane that was built at the four seat airplane that was built at the LAA rally ages ago? Then ah, that, well, that was the the one that came before that. Was, that was the the plain old Sling Four, which was still a great airplane, but that was powered by um, they've improved. They improved the sling for to make the TSI. There's some flush riveting, a bit of change to aerofoil, things like that. Um, the original sling four had the Rotax 914 turbo in it, uh, okay. whereas this has got the 915 in it. So probably, yeah. I'm, sling four is probably quite an efficient performer, but maybe not quite as good as the TSI though. So. Okay, so at the moment you're in the lead, Ed, with 116.8 kilograms. Should I go next? We leave Johnny's work of genius yeah. to the end then? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. So I don't know if any, not many people have heard of this manufacturer. It's a manufacturer in France called Iswa Aviation, uh, sort of two thirds of the way down France in kind of the centre. And they make a couple of aircraft, including this one, the Simba. The Simba is a four seat aircraft. Uh, by the looks of the canopy, it specialises in cooking its occupants in the south of France <laughs> very slowly. So imagine it gets quite toasty in there. Um, that is powered by the Rotax 915. Um, and so it's a. I looked at the numbers now. 114 knots uh, doesn't sound too fast. In fact, it's not too fast. It's exactly 114 knots. The airplane will go much, much faster. But this is kind of like at max range. So this is kind of like flying at a very slow speed. But at that at that point, the uh, 
915S is only burning 18 litres an hour. So it's going to take you two and a half hours to get there. 39.6 litres of fuel burnt uh, for 95.04 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So I that think that's, fantastic. Uh, that's good. Despite the fact that you'll probably get there with a very red head if you haven't got a hat. Uh, just have a hat. But that, I mean, hat. That, that is a real, I think the, the Simba is a real gem of a machine. It's the ARSA certified as well. It um, is. You know, and to carry four four people so efficiently, yeah. really, really fantastic. I, I think when this COVID thing makes life easier, and maybe in the spring, we should all jump in the 182 and uh, head down to Iswa and go and go and have a go and have go and visit them. I think. Yeah. It would be an interesting yeah. little trip. Fantastic machine. Right, Which Johnny, really built you up just so we yeah. can knock you down. Yeah. <laughs> no chance. So I've gone. I've gone. Bert again. So this is the scaled composites. And I'll get this right this time. Cat bird, not the catfish. Yes. <laughs> Look, at, Look that. at that. That's a beauty. It first flew in um, 1988. Um, it only, I think it only really flew once. And then it was basically hung upside down in the scale composites hangar for years and years. And then it was restored in 2011. Um, but it's a yeah, very slippery airframe. It's got a really interesting... Um, seating layout so at the front it's like a mclaren f1 with the pilot in the center with two passengers slightly staggered back either side and then in the rear there's two rearward facing seats if i'm corrected uh yeah so it's you sit there's four seats in the back two facing yes. backwards two facing forwards and yes. like you say that the pilot p1 up front sits center line yeah yeah, um, so th it's, um, it, it's powered by a TIO 360, 210 horsepower, which is basically the same engine that's in um, an Arrow. Um, but it won a CAFE or CAFE, um, CAFE Foundation uh, competition for a, a basically a fuel consumption speed payload challenge back in the um, late 80s. And it achieved just over 20 miles per gallon which is pretty good at 200 miles per hour. So it's cruising 172, 173 knots. Um, so it, it won't necessarily win this competition, but it looks great. And yeah, so there we go, 173 knots, fuel burn 38 litres an hour, 55 litres for the journey, and that gave 132 kilos of DO2, which is a, it's a brilliant aeroplane. But imagine if you stuck the Rotax 916 in there or, a diesel engine and i did yes. say the 916 <laughs> yeah the super secret rotax yeah. that they've 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 offered yeah because i'm sure that airplane would still perform quite well <coughs> on excuse me on 160 horsepower mm. so um but i i and i'd forgotten all about the catbird by the time i'd picked my sling tsi and i'm glad johnny picked picked the catbird because it is a brilliant machine and this is remembering that you know this is something from the 80s mm -hmm. um which is and it, and it's it's in private hands people. now. Mm. So, yeah. Well, but, um, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think it is a really interesting machine. But you know, given 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 the actual challenge that we set ourselves, I think that makes you come last, Johnny. Actually, yeah, it does. <laughs> but, but imagine. I'm, to be fair, it, this is fancy hanger, and Johnny's going to rock up on the apron with his machine, and everyone's going to be looking at that. Not my boring sling. You're going to say it's the catch first. <laughs> what was that, Dave? They're all going to say it's the cat's whiskers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Paul Frey the venison is shocked. Ian has, has actually won. Yeah, I mean, technically is won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I thought Catkin Catkin came up with a good idea, which was to get Guy Westgate to tow three gliders behind him in the um, <laughs> in the well, one hundred and nine or something. Like D Day. <laughs> yeah, but would that would that actually work, or would that end up being super inefficient? So. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we did. We did actually take a look at a couple of other aircraft uh, that you're looking at there. So we took a look at the Diesel Robin, the DR4A1. Uh, yeah. And the numbers on the Diesel Robin, and the, these are kind of real, real world numbers uh, provided by the chap who actually owns the airplane. So 60 percent, 60 percent power with four people on board will generate 112 knots. Fuel burn at 60 percent power is 20 liters of jet fuel. So That's it's right. two and a. 2.25 hours, 45 litres, 116 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So that's a pretty efficient aeroplane if we go for. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's really really good. A couple of a couple of others that I forgot about. Well, 
Um, obviously, also in the LAA permit world, the Pioneer 400, which you can get again with the Rotax 915, four people, uh, plenty of fuel and speedy. Um, I, I haven't run the complete numbers on that, but I'm pretty sure that's going to come out and produce a set of numbers somewhere between the Sling and the um, and uh, Ian's Simba. Uh, but the Absolute, if you want to fly four people from Gloucester to Glasgow and generate no CO2 emissions, then you need the Pipistrel HY4, powered by hydrogen, absolutely zero CO2 emissions, uh, you'll have to make a few stops on the way, but this does actually seat four people um, and, yeah, powered by hydrogen and uh, is the super eco way of doing that journey, but uh, possibly not so practical. That looks like a couple of Taurus. Uh, it was, waiting. yeah. A couple yeah, of Taurus yeah. gliders that have mm, yeah. had a late some night coupling or something. Yeah, some famous, famously brilliant thinking by Pipistrel to, to win an, another um, efficiency, uh, again, to win the cafe efficiency competition. And um, they went, you know, if we, if we stick two of our gliders together, that gives us four seats and makes a very efficient aeroplane. So, um, yeah. Mm. Mm. Great. Okay. okay. So, Events. What's on this weekend then, Dave? Apart from Pilot Careers Live, be there. See but, you on Sunday. Well, there's not much on this time Saturday. of year, but there is uh, the, Co the Compton Abbas Vintage Saturday on Saturday. Uh, apart from that, there's not very much on. Coming up, though, on the 15th of November, there's the Royal Aeronautical Society uh, GA Design Conference. That's in London. And I did actually look at uh, Gasco to see whether they're holding their safety evenings. Now, Gasco lost the contract from a CAA to provide safety information. It's gone to another company called Astral Aviation Consulting. And I did look to see if they were going to start the safety evenings, which normally would start about now and run through the winter. Um, apparently, they're holding a, a, a webinar on the 17th of November about uh, inadvertent IMC and how to avoid it. But so far, that's it. There's no safety evenings, which I think is a, a real loss. To Come the, on, Astral. Uh, get your, to get your together. I want a sticker. Yeah. <laughs> a sticker? In my logbook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, got to love a sticker. Did you, when you went to the dentist, Johnny, did you, were, they, did we, were, they still giving, were they still giving stickers away when you were a child? <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah, they're asking me about IMC as well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Peter about the club then, Johnny. Yeah. Peter Cox yeah, quickly um, says, Gasco did a safety evening for us in Devon, so they must still be going on. So. Brilliant. Yeah, club That's members. One. That's a secret one, though. Um, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> so, hands up. We could probably talk to Gasco and see if they put on a, a flyer safe, a flyer streamed safety evening, not during the live stream because it would take too long, but maybe one other night of the week we could have a flyer club safety evening open mm. to any. Not, it wouldn't be flyer club, would it? It'd be anyone, basically. Mm. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, flyer club members, go out and use your landing fees for this month and then December, which Dave mentioned um, earlier. We've got some good range of airfields, and thank you to all the F F F port operators that contributed the free landings for that, because that's really helpful. Um, and also, we'll get the next webinar sorted very soon, so you can come and join us in an evening. We'll hear some expert advice on an interesting topic, and um, we have provisionally spoken to Lester about running a real live stream from Leicester at some point. So the four of us will get our heads together and work out exactly when that can be. And we'll let you know all about it. I think we, I also got an offer, which I haven't mentioned yet to you because uh, we've all had too much on our plate and this is not till next April, but it's from David to go and do it up at Easter airfield, which is, which would be an interesting, wow. an interesting one up there. It's a long yeah. way, um, but he's, he's, he needs to check the broadband or the, the internet speed up there. Cause that might be a bit of a challenge. Yeah. We should get no. Starlink. <laughs> Yeah. Starling, yeah. yeah, that'd be a nice one to do in summer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. So, seven pound fifty a quarter. We've done all that. I think That's we it. are just about done. Kaki um, Ridley asks live audience at Leicester. If we do a live stream at Leicester, that yeah. would be the plan. Yeah. The idea would be we'll go up there, we'll set up, we'll do a live stream, and then we'll. I haven't. I don't think we've spoken to Leicester about this yet, but basically, it'd be like a, a curry night afterwards. Yeah. Surprise. Would be the plan. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the plan anyway okay right well i do believe that's the end let's just bring graham back in thank you very much graham thank you very much everybody else um 
uh, we've enjoyed tonight and we'll enjoy next week as well. So if you're a club member, we'll see you next Wednesday. If you're not, we'll see you next Thursday. Have a great weekend flying. Sunday's looking good. If you're thinking about a career on the flight deck, come to Softail uh, T5 on Sunday. But get a ticket first Saturday. or view it That's online. Right. Sorry? Saturday. Not Saturday. Sunday. Did I say Sunday? Don't turn up on Sunday. We'll be gone. <laughs> We'll be gone. I'm going flying on Sunday. Well, at least that's my plan. So uh, anyway, uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very much, and see you all soon. Cheers, all. Bye bye. bye. I can find this little thing. Oh, well done, Ed. <laughs>